President Oaks and my dear brethren and sisters, I've felt since the beginning of this meeting what an honor it is to partic participate in the award that was just given to Dr. Harvey Fletcher. Over most of the years of my life, he's been one of the living legends that we have heard about, and today I had, for the first time, the privilege of making his acquaintance. I'd just like to say that Dr. Fletcher is undoubtedly one of the great scientists of the world and certainly one of the greatest of the members of the church. President Oaks neglected, maybe it didn't get on the record, to mention the fact that I also attended Brigham Young University. So I feel that I belong here just as much as any of the, of the rest. Uh, maybe I didn't achieve somewhat like Dr. Fletcher in his first science course, but I hope somewhere or other I can be found to be a participant with you. I talked yesterday with my dentist who said, imagine that Marriott Center where you're going to speak. He said, all we had was the George Albert v. Smith Field House when I attended BYU. And I said, have you ever heard of College Hall? I don't suppose many of you have either. <laughs> Probably Dr. Fletcher can remember well beyond College, college Hall. It was suggested, I suppose others have thought of it before, that the title for my remarks today in view of your coming examinations should be, If You Are Prepared, You Shall Not Fear. <laughs> I have, in fact, thought to, to speak about something connected with the opening hymn, Oh, How Lovely Was the Morning. I want to say something about the gospel being restored. In the church, we really have only one basic subject to talk about. Everything hinges on the fact that the gospel has been restored. I know that you and all of us understand about the re restoration, but we don't always remember all of its implications. This has to be one, this has to be the greatest news event since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is more important by far than world wars or atom bombs. It is more far reaching than space flight or men on Mars. There is something in it that the whole world must hear about. As we proclaim and teach and remind both members and those not in the church that we wonder why people don't pay more attention if it's all that important. Perhaps we don't tell it right. One good reason, of course, why people don't pay attention is that most of the people in the world haven't heard about it yet. Very few of those not of the Church understand about the Restoration, and for various reasons. First of all, they are probably not too interested. Second, the Restoration would offend their traditions. Third, obedience to the gospel would upset their plans and interests. And so most people act as if they would rather that it hadn't happened. Speaking one day to a minister of another faith after I had answered all of his questions in a friendly discussion, and after he had taken a day or two to reflect on what I had told him, said with considerable warmth, I think what you teach is a very dangerous heresy. Possibly I had done a poor job of explaining, but you see, he really didn't want the gospel to be restored. Some of the members of the Church don't pay much attention either. Their reasons may be that the Church requires too much of their time and effort, that keeping the commandments would spoil their lifestyle. And many people simply don't want to be involved that much and make commitments. As we all know, however, it really has happened, and it is true. Such, an earth such earth shaking events come so rarely that people tend to quickly forget the reality in them. A most unusual demonstration of this attitude is found in the book of 3 Nephi. After a prophecy had been given that the birth of the Savior would be signified by a period of a day, a night, and a day without darkness, 
As the time approached, those who didn't believe and who didn't want it to happen began to threaten those who were watching for the sign. You can imagine the feelings of the believers as they waited and waited and wondered if perhaps it wouldn't come after all. But it came. Everything predicted in relation to the Savior will come and has to come. But then, at the time of the crucifixion of the Savior, nearly everyone of those who had heard about it on the American continent had forgotten the first wonderful sign of the day and the night and the day, and they ignored the threat of another and more terrible sign that had been predicted. Certainly, they thought it wouldn't really happen. Such things don't happen in this world, you know, <clears throat> but it happened. And it came to pass in the thirty and fourth year of the first month, on the fourth day of the month, there arose a great storm, such an one as never had been known in all the land. And before the trouble was over, it didn't matter anymore about the warning. Those who hadn't listened were gone. The implications to, to us from the restoration of the gospel are, first, that we can really know that God lives. Second, the gospel will guide us to a richer, happier, more purposeful life on earth. And third, we know that God watches over us. And fourth, we have assurances that we will live again after death and renew our association with those loved ones we have lost. We have received the promise of a life so rich and happy that its wonders have only been hinted at. <coughs> Let me give you this example from the 76th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. They are they into whose hands the Father has given all things. They are they who are priests and kings, who receive of his fullness and of his glory, and are priests of the Most High. Wherefore, all things are theirs, whether of things present or things to come. These shall dwell in the presence of God and His Christ forever and ever. Maybe there are some people that don't want that to happen either. Now, we're expected to spread the news. We must see to it that other people understand and believe. Our own blessings depend on how well we take the gospel to the world. Everybody must hear about it. For said the Lord in his preface to the Book of Commandments or the Doctrine and Covenants, Verily the voice of the Lord is unto all men, and there is none to escape, and there is no eye that shall not see, neither ear that shall not hear, neither heart that shall not be penetrated, and the rebellious shall be pierced with much sorrow. For their iniquities shall be spoken upon the housetops, and their secret acts shall be revealed. And the voice of warning shall be unto all people by the mouths of my disciples whom I have chosen in these last days. And all of us here in the Church are the disciples spoken of. We ought to improve our method for spreading the gospel. Most of us could do a better example to make the news more receptible. We really do need to learn better ways of teaching and we must increase our ability to announce the news. Here are some of the examples of what the gospel really means to people on the earth. Some of this I'd like to speak to w without the written text, but from your recollection. You may, for example, remember something of the story of Adam and Eve as they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. And in that sad circumstance, they now wondered what could become of them. You can imagine that they had enjoyed the fullness of the blessings of a rich and wonderful life actually in the presence of their Father in heaven. And now because of transgression they were cast out and had nowhere really that they wanted to go. They were told to go to work and do what they had to do and doggedly they went about their task. If you read carefully in the fifth chapter of the book of Moses you will see that they went through a long trial. They began to have children. These were not the children you hear about, that is, Cain and Abel and Seth. They had other children before those. 
These children grew up, and they had children as they began to pair off and divide in the land. So Adam and Eve were now grandparents, and they were still struggling in an almost hopeless circumstance. What are we here for now? We've lost it all. Where can we go? One day, as Adam was out offering a sacrifice, which he did because he had been told to, an angel of the Lord appeared to Adam, and he said, Adam, what are you doing? And Adam said, I'm offering a sacrifice unto the Lord. Why are you doing that, Adam? He said, I know not, save the Lord commanded me. Then the angel spake, saying, This thing is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father. And thou shalt repent and call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. And from that moment the Holy Ghost, or the Spirit of God, fell upon Adam. And there was a revelation given to him as to the purpose of life and the purpose of the Son of God in bringing him a redemption whereby he really could, along with his wife, return back to that blessed circumstance that he had lost. Can you imagine the joy with which he returned and told his wife and how she rejoiced as she said, I see it all now. There was a purpose in it. Thanks even for our transgression, because it brought about the things that we now can enjoy as the greatest gifts in life. There are other stories. My wife happens to be a connection to the family of Jacob Hamblin. Uh, those who have worked with me over the years know that I have a particular feeling for the story of Jacob Hamblin. I suppose his name is known to most members of the Church. But he had a particular ability to explain his feelings and the motivating power of faith that touched his life. So I'd like to rehearse just a little what the gospel meant to him. He said he first heard of the gospel when he was living on the frontiers of Wisconsin. He heard through a friend or a neighbor that there were preachers in the area and that they were proclaiming that the gospel had been restored. And they said it would be the privilege of every man to find out for himself through the Spirit if it were true. He said he didn't understand much about what that meant, but the feeling so fired his mind that he could hardly wait to go hear this news that the gospel had been restored. He found the missionaries holding a meeting in a house, and he arrived after the meeting had begun. And as he listened to the message, he felt, This is what I've been searching for, what I need more than anything in life. How can I know if it's true? As if he had answered the question aloud, as if he had asked the question aloud, the elder stood up again and said, If there's anyone here who would like to know the truth of what we have just told you, we promise you that if you'll be baptized by immersion and receive the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Lord will reveal it to you. And Jacob said, That's good enough for me. I'll do that, even though it costs the sacrifice of everything I have. He went home and told his wife. She said, Oh, yes, that's just what it will cost you. I won't live with you anymore if you join that church. His father and his brothers said to Jacob, What's the matter with you? Don't you know that those are the Mormons? It's one thing to get religion, but why did you have to choose the worst one there is? Well, he still had that independence of spirit, and he had made an arrangement for his baptism. And so he proceeded to meet the elders. But he said on the way, as he was going to be baptized, he began to reflect on what the sacrifice would mean. And it seemed almost too much to bear, and he was on the point of turning back. That's a good thing for missionaries to remember, that this wavering happens with most people when they are about to join the Church. But he said as he was about to turn back, he felt the presence of someone near him, and he felt that it was his grandfather, and he heard the voice say, Go forward, my son. You cannot comprehend the joy that will come into your life as a consequence of what you're about to do today. So thus fortified, he went forward and met the elders and was baptized into the Church. As they confirmed him a member of the Church, the elders said, The spirits in prison have greatly rejoiced over what you have done. He didn't understand that, but he told them of his experience with his grandfather on the way. And then they explained to him the great work of the salvation for the dead. And suddenly he knew why he had joined the Church not just to satisfy his own interest and curiosity, but now he understood he was to become an instrument in the, li in the hand of the Lord to bring the same joy and privilege and blessing to the lives of many other people. And he returned and told his family what he had done. 
evidently they said worse than they had said before. But now he said, I just laughed at them. And I told my father, never mind. Within two years, I'll baptize you in the church too. <clears throat> well, they all followed him. And they went through the turmoil and the trials in the days of Nauvoo. Uh, after the death of the prophet and the exodus, they followed across Iowa and across the plains. In the process, his wife did leave him. His mother died on the way. They settled in Tooele and then were called to go to what must have seen the very ends of the earth down in southern Utah at that time, a, a desolate desert inhabited by what he thought were the most lowly people that he had ever seen on the face of the earth. While living there, his father died in a little hut. At, about, at the time of his death, he called Jacob to him and he said something like this, Jacob, you know, you have been as a Joseph to your family, like Joseph who was sold into Egypt. You have brought salvation to your family. Uh, thanks for your persistence and faithfulness. Thanks, Jacob, for all these blessings. Now, doesn't that sound a little strange to you? What blessings could he possibly be thankful for down there dying in the desert under miserable circumstances? Thanks for all these blessings, Jacob. Well, he knew what he talked of. He thought of the gospel that had been restored. And he said, there's no use to pray for me that I stay here longer. I know the gospel. It's time for me to go where I'll be happier. Thanks for those great blessings. There's another story about Abraham. <clears throat> Many stories, I guess, about Abraham. But if you read in the first chapter of the book of Abraham, you will recognize that Abraham didn't always know the gospel, and it came to him with a great impact and a power. He said, in effect, I knew that men before me had possessed gifts and powers which I didn't have. And so he said, I found it necessary to change my place of residence. I decided to move from Ur in Chaldea up to Haran, which is now in Turkey, because, he said, when I get up there, they have promised me a good job. I'll make $50,000 a year. I'll get a beautiful home. They'll give me a car and a boat and a camper and three months vacation and all the medical benefits. I guess some of you haven't read that. <laughs> he really said it a little bit differently. Now, some of you in a few days or weeks will possibly move from Provo to Chicago or Denver or Cleveland, and you'll have in mind some of those things. Properly so, perhaps, the car and the job and the boat and some of the other nice things of life. What Abraham really said was, knowing about those blessings that others had had before me, I sought for the blessings of the fathers and the right whereunto I should be ordained to administer the same. Having myself been a follower of righteousness, desiring also to be one who possessed greater knowledge and to be the father of many nations, a prince of peace. Now, you can see that Abraham wasn't content to play for those little things. He wanted to own the whole kingdom. That's what he was after. <clears throat> now, he didn't get it all at once. He knew it would take a little time, 50, 60, 80 years. I don't know just how long it took him. But it says further in Hebrews, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should afterward receive for an inheritance, obeyed. By faith he sojourned in a land of promise, as in a strange country. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He died in faith, not having received yet the promises, but having seen them afar off, and was persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that he was really a stranger and a pilgrim upon the earth. Now. What's it like in this world among people who don't have the gospel? Let me read from a recent article as I quote, If any skeptics remain, let them go anywhere in the city and stop and look around. 
For example, on the back road leading to the university, one can see regally attired equestrians on one side, while on the other, motorcycles, dune buggies, and all-terrain vehicles skitter across the hills like jackrabbits. Near the institute on a bluff overlooking the golf course, vroom, a single-engine plane jounces across a field and takes off with a glider in tow. Even more of a spectacle are the hang gliders soaring off the same cliff as, cliff as the sailplanes, while far below, as far as the eye can see, surfboarders ride the rollers and strings of joggers take in the stunning scenery, which includes a group of nudists playing soccer. There is no escaping the sports scene. Plunge into the translucent waters off the point and there seem to be as many skin and scuba divers as fish. On weekends, when the pro teams are not at home, the stadium is shared by drag strippers and wheelchair races. The catalog goes on and on. Stock car races, go-karting, skydiving, ballooning, 21 sports car clubs, 350 yacht races, 100, 1,500 bowling leagues. Living here is like being on an eternal vacation. End of quote. Now, contrary to what you may think, I'm not opposed to recreation, but you get the feeling out of that article that the perspective of life has gone. And there are some people who seem to be literally hell-bent for fun. If the article had been talking about Utah, it would have probably have included the skiing, the hunting, and again, the campers, the four-wheel ve vehicles, and other things that we really don't always have all that much time for. When you're a faithful member of the church, life need not be less exciting, but it really isn't what you see in the movies and on television. Because members of the church are a called people. We were sent here for a purpose. We are committed and dedicated. You who have served as missionaries are slowly finding out that the mission term wasn't for just two years. As you thought it was, you are enlisted for the duration. You may not all understand that, but back in the years of the Great War, as we were being called up and enlisted, they didn't tell us when we'd get out. They just said, for the duration. And six months, they added. <clears throat> That's what you're for in the gospel. Now we can act like the people of the world if we want to, taking the toys and the cake and the candy, but we will miss out on the really great prize. Remember, he that findeth, findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. There are things you can't do as members of the church. For one thing, you can't take a Las Vegas-style vacation. I don't know whether you all knew that. <clears throat> you can't bat, gamble, bet on the horses, or play with playing cards. You can't be loose, immoral, and violent, even though the world wants you all, all you men at least, to imitate the Marlboro man and to be macho. Those attitudes really don't belong to you. They don't demonstrate the Christ-like qualities. You can't be dishonest. You can't cheat or deceive. You can't break the word of wisdom. You can't take immoral liberties in dating or other associations. If you do, you should be excommunicated from the church. You have no excuse. You're bright young people and you know better. <clears throat> now, of course, you can do as you please, but remember that the Lord's free agency is just like it is in the Army. We used to hear soldiers army uh, argue that the Army couldn't make you do anything you didn't want to. But there was always some wise old head who would quickly point out, no, they can't make you do it, but they can sure make you wish you had. <clears throat> Now the Lord operates on a rather similar principle. Now what can you do? In fact, what must you do as a member of the Church? Well, we must love everybody. Yes, take it literally. Especially your wife or your husband. Quite a few older people in the Church get, forget that. You must be true. Go to Church. Give unstinting service. Go on a mission. Go to the temple. Pay your tithing. Why must you do all these things? Because when you understand, you will see that it's worth it, and you would really rather live that way if you know all the perspectives. 
In your daily work, you must have an occupation which contributes to the benefit of humanity and over which you can ask the blessings of the Lord from day to day. Anything else would be unworthy. You are committed to be a conservationist in its true sense. We have no right to squander the Earth's blessings. Learn not to waste food, energy, gasoline. My father used to tell the story about the man who bought a pig for $5 in the spring and sold him for $5 in the fall. And when he was asked how he made money that way, he said, well, I didn't make much on the transaction, but I had the use of the pig all summer. <laughs> now, all of you people don't understand that. Those days are a little in the past, but a friend of mine said, I wasn't allowed if I were eating an apple and didn't want to finish it to throw it away. I had to find a chicken or a pig or something to give it to so I wouldn't waste it. That was a, an ancient virtue that needs to be cultivated yet in our time. Many potent examples show how people still must learn to think correctly. I have a friend who after he was married in the temple, drifted away from the church. He was an airline pilot. As time went on, one of his companions, who was also a member of the church, said, Look, friend, you're not helping me any. He said, I used to live like you do, but I've changed. I'm in the bishopric now, and everything I do that I try to build up the church, you tear down. He said, I want you to change. And because my friend respected this man, he began to change his ways, went back to church, and began to get active. He said, however, he had one vice. He liked to gamble. He could play cards when they were away from home with the other pilots, and he was good at it, and he hated to give that up because he won quite a bit of money. He said, though, one day as I went to pay my tithing, I thought, let's see, how do I pay tithing on this money I won gambling? That solved the problem for him. Other questions are solved by straight thinking. My father used to meet the test that farmers generally met about whether I should haul my hay on Sunday because it's about to rain. And uh, that was quite a test once upon a time. My father answered it by saying, let it rain. I don't care if it rains on the hay, I don't have to eat hay. <laughs> <clears throat> well, what if we don't want to keep the commandments? Brother L. Ray Christiansen used to tell of a man who came over from Denmark he was capable of amassing wealth, and he gave up a, a rather substantial fortune to join the church and came to Utah. After he settled here, he again had the ability to build up his resources, and in the process he lost his testimony. As the brethren visited him, they'd say, well, you're not doing right, you know, and he'd never, never listen. One day two brethren were visiting, and one of them said, now look, Lars, it's not right what you do. He didn't pay any attention. He said, look, Lars, you can't take it with you, you know. Well, that touched Lars. And he said, what's that you say? I told you, you can't take it with you. And Lars said, well, then I will not go. <clears throat> Brother Christiansen bore testimony that he has gone. Uh, recently, we heard of the death of Brother Rockefeller, who was one of the wealthiest men in the world. My son asked me how much he left. The standard answer, of course, is he left it all, as all will do. There is a story in closing told by President Kimball. I wish I had it here to quote verbatim, but I'll have to do it from memory and pray that I don't too much mutilate it. But he said, in substance, I went to visit my friend. He met me at the airport. How do you like my car, he said, as he showed me his uh, luxurious limousine. On the way from the airport to his home, he stopped the car and we got out and he said, see all this from the mountains on the right hand over to the river on the left, it's all mine. The way Brother Kimball said mine made you feel the covetousness that the man had in his possessions. Then they proceeded to his home, which was truly a palace. President Kimball said, I spoke at his funeral not long ago. They buried him in a piece of land, the length of a tall man, the width of a heavy man. And as I returned from the cemetery, I observed the cattle in the field, seemingly unaware that there had been a change of ownership. 
Now, I ask you, do you understand that story? Is there anyone five years old who can't understand that? It's as plain as day what life is all about. That's why we have the gospel with us. That's why it has been restored. That's why we are called upon to give service and to bring forth fruit as those who know the truth and know the difference. I give you my testimony that I know that the gospel is true and that it has been restored, that that knowledge supersedes in importance every other thing that has been told to us in all the years of our lives. It takes precedence over all the other projects and activities that people anywhere may want to do. I pray that we will be faithful and true to what that implies for all of us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.